So welcome. Thank you all for joining in today. We are very happy to host this series of talks. Uh, this is part of our conversations that we are having about climate change, and it's part of the collective intelligence efforts that we as a country office have embarked recently together with the Accelerator Lab global team. Uh, we are discussing here in the intersection of heat and health, and this is part of the important conversation that we have been doing in the level of advocacy to see what and how much more we can do basically to support the ecosystem, to support the actors, but also to support each other in our efforts for really targeting uh, the actions that we want to have, the actions that we need in the area of climate uh, change. Um, today, uh, I will just briefly introduce you the speaker. So uh, we will have a host welcoming by Armen Grigorian, who is the resident representative of UNDP country office in North Macedonia. Then we will be having uh, a bit of a presentation, but also key point and messages, both from our guests, uh, Dr. Natalia Linus and Dr. Kimberly Humphrey from uh, the FXP Center for Health and Human Rights at Harvard. And then we also be going to have an overview of the collective intelligence mm -hmm. climate action we are doing at global level at Accelerator Labs uh, by uh, Gina Lucarelli, who is the team lead of, of Accelerator Labs Global. And we will be finally touching briefly about the points that we as the Accelerator Lab together with our environment team are doing in the area of collective intelligence. So before further ado, Armen, please. Thank you very much, uh, Anita. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, it is very uh, nice to see some familiar faces and reconnect with uh, uh, some that you know, uh, I met uh, earlier. I would like to uh, extend very warm welcome to all the participants of the call who are joining us today on the heat and health uh, discussion. Uh, <clears throat> UNDP in North Macedonia actually is working on various dimensions of uh, uh, heat and health. Then we have air pollution and health and we have climate and health and heat. Uh, so this is uh, part of a broader engagement of the country office in the issues that are related to climate change, to health, and then connecting it to productivity, to economic growth, to inclusiveness of economic growth, etc. Uh, <clears throat> we have, uh, as country office, already supported the local government in the city of Skopje on the issue of heat. Uh, which has been a growing concern in the region. You may recall that, you know, uh, last uh, couple of years, uh, more or less all European capitals have experienced something like heat waves. It was the case for Skopje as well. I think three years ago, it was hit by uh, strong heat waves uh, with a very uh, strong and negative impact on health, uh, on health in, in the country. I had a recent discussion with the WHO and Ministry of Finance that uh, are also working on this. Accelerator Lab at the same time in collaboration with the Environment Unit is working on collective intelligence on heat and uh, weather induced risks. We are exploring innovative ways to harness data, technology and community engagement to identify, monitor and respond to uh, heat risks uh, in a more effective and more inclusive uh, manner. <clears throat> Climate change, of course, is one of the strongest factors that it uh, exacerbates the effect uh, of the heat and heat waves on people and infrastructure, and it is becoming increasingly important to consider these impacts in our work. Rising temperatures and changing weather, weather uh, patterns Extreme weather events uh, are uh, making vulnerable populations are even more vulnerable and it also affects the infrastructure. UNDP is uh, part of the Global Coalition for Disaster and Climate Resilient Infrastructure that is uh, <coughs> based in the, with the Secretariat uh, in New Delhi, but uh, supported by 
the government of India. Recently, we also had the privilege of hosting a seminar with Athens Chief Heat Officer and uh, Green Rush Rockefeller Foundation Resilience Center uh, on the heat uh, and the impact on heat uh, in North Macedonia, but also beyond with the regional uh, impact. I think it was a great opportunity. There were some country offices of UNDP that demonstrated a uh, very strong interest in continuing this discussion. Urban heat islands are a complex phenomena. They are influenced by a variety of factors and it requires a combination of approaches and you know very inclusive and comprehensive approaches sometimes. Uh, in increasing the vegetation cover, promoting green infrastructure, urban gardening, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, etc. etc. Health impacts on urban heat islands cannot be ignored. Exposure to extreme heat can lead to a range of health problems, including heat exhaustion, heat stroke, dehydration, etc. Vulnerable population groups such as children, el elderly, those with pre-existing health conditions are particularly at risk. And uh, I think these are also less uh, groups that will require a very you know, targeted and tailored attention. In conclusion, colleagues, uh, we hope that this webinar is an informative and engaging uh, process that we can continue to work together to address the challenges posed by the heat and ensure the health and well-being of the people of North Macedonia, but also broader in the region, uh, can benefit from it. So uh, good luck with the event and with the process. And thank you very much again for your partnership and participation. Thank you. Thank you, Armin. Thanks a lot. So just a, a short introduction for our guests today. We have uh, Dr. Natalia Linos. She's a social epidemiologist and the executive director of the FXP Center for Center for, Hu for Health and Human Rights at Harvard. With over 15 years of experience in public health, Natalia has worked on some of the most pressing challenges of our time, including climate change and systematic racism. Uh, the center, uh, at the center, she has helped to build a new research area focuses on racial justice and co-leads the two largest programs in this area aimed at creating an actionable field of scholarships uh, on structural racism and health and making public health case for uh, reparations. Prior to her role at Harvard, Natalia also worked at United Nations uh, uh, development program for over a decade in diverse soil, including uh, UNDP's work at the nexus of health and climate change at the and the environment. She is a committed public servant and currently serves as a town meeting member in Brookline uh, and the board of the Environmental League of Massachusetts. Um, together with Natalia, today we have also Dr. Kimberly Humphrey. She is a uh, climate change and a human health fellow at the center. Uh, Dr. Humphrey is an emergency physician from Australia with a keen interest in the adaptation of health systems to climate change, particularly in the relation to emergency medicine. She is currently investigating the impacts of extreme weather events on healthcare with a focus on impacts of wildfires in Australia and California. She is a clinical senior lecturer at the University of Adelaide and serves as a senior editor for the Emergency Medicine Australia, Australia Journal. She is also on the National Board of Directors from the Environment Australia and holds numerous committee roles within the uh, Australian, Australian College of Emergency Medicine. I hope I said all in a, in a right manner because both of the guests today come with an enormous, with an enormous uh, background. Uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, the floor is yours, Natalia. Thank you so much, Ardita, and I appreciate if you're able to share, yeah, the slides that we have. Um, so our conversation today, uh, we're only going to speak for about fifteen minutes, myself and um, Kimberly, and my role is to sort of set the stage. You can go to the next slide, Ardita. 
So the FXV Center for Health and Human Rights, you might ask why, why health and human rights, uh, why are we focusing on climate and health? And first of all, our mission is to use interdisciplinary approaches to promote equity and dignity for those oppressed by racism, poverty and stigma nationally and around the world. And we do so in partnership. We partner with UN agencies, WHO, we partner with local officials, we partner with civil uh, organizations, but really we are a research uh, entity that's trying to move the needle. Um, and I do need to say that, you know, COVID was sort of a wake up call for a lot of people in public health, that public health is political, that really it is about governance, it's about institutions, it's about decision making and trust. And so we think that the climate and health and this conversation and heat and health is not simply a discussion that is technical, one that should be happening among doctors or among environmentalists, but really a political decision. Next slide. So. If you want to go to the next slide, I did that. So, you know, for social epidemiologists, uh, I consider myself a social epidemiologist. One of the most um, sort of important reports was the WHO's report on the Commission on the Social Determinants of Health. And I bring it up because during that commission, although they said that climate change was outside the scope of their work, they really um, kind of made it clear that our health is shaped by where we live, where we are born, where we grow, where we go to school, where we work and age. And in fact, at that time, we were thinking a lot about poverty, around social conditions, but climate change is one of the most important factors that's going to shape those conditions. And most importantly, and it's often forgotten, the WHO report said that these circumstances are shaped by the distribution of money, power, and resources at the global, national, and local levels. So really our conversation today is a technical one about heat and health, but it's also one about resources, about how do we invest in the future, and how do we think about distributional equity. Um, next slide. So climate change impacts on health equity is the frame that I hope uh, we brings us into the conversation. My colleague Kimberly will talk about sort of the more technical piece, but I think we need to think about three levels of equity. Clearly, there's the inequities between countries, and we you know, saw the floods in Pakistan displacing about a third uh, of the population, but also with heat, we know there are entire regions uh, of our world which uh, for many months will be uninhabitable. We also know that there are inequities within countries, and often we forget about that on the climate scale. We uh, know that people of color in England, for example, live, live in communities with very high air pollution. I'm from Greece. We know that the Roma people um, live in you know, areas where there will be more heat, but also exposure to toxic pollution and other for forms of pollution. So, you know, we have to, in both, uh, in all circumstances, talking about both inequities between and within, and with the climate crisis, unfortunately, this is one of these crises that the intergenerational equity components are really strong. So if we think that we are living in a world with um, extreme events right now, and you know we're connecting to you from Boston, where we're expecting this Thursday and Friday to have record heat. Um, we're expecting 30 degrees Celsius when typical April uh, degrees are you know 14, 15 degrees Celsius. So it is, uh, you know, we're experiencing it now, but the expectation is that the next generation, our children, are going to be having heat waves that are much more frequent, much more severe. And so um, the intergenerational piece, we really don't know. We have to model and predict in sort of, we don't have the data because what we expect is going to be so much harsher. So let's not forget that um, equity piece. Next slide. So this is my last slide, and it's basically to help us think about our conversation after the presentations. Really, a complex issue like heat and health can't be solved at one level. You know, it can't be the local level. It can't be just the national. It can't be just the international. And it's really thinking about how the levels intersect, how different actions at different levels work. And then importantly, who are the key stakeholders and who's left out of decision making and policy planning? I hope that by centering equity at the beginning, we really understand that those who are most impacted, those who are most likely to have to move, uh, you know, migrate because heat will make their, you know, lands not not livable, uh, are people that need to be part of the decision making. So 
uh, you know, stakeholder analyses, the work, the core work of UNDP around governance is really critical to the climate, heat and health conversa conversation. And what we often don't think about is where is their opposition? You know, in real, uh, the real world, you know, the fossil fuel industries have a lot of power. We know that a lot of policymakers live in, you know, air conditioned housing, so they may not realize the real impacts. But there is a cost to an action. The cost is high. Um, and I hope that in our conversation we can talk about a range of institutions. How is heat going to impact schools and learning? We know that you know test scores are impacted by heat. How is uh, heat going to impact the labor market if you're not able to do construction outdoors? How is heat going to impact our healthcare system? And of course, these solutions, local um, actors are going to have to solve for those, but without the mitigation efforts at the international level, we really are just going to be trying to band-aid our way out of this. So uh, with that, over to you, Kimberly. Thanks so much, Natalia. And we'll go to the next slide, please. Um, and as Natalia has outlined, I think it's really important for us all to appreciate at the outset that heat is very complex. It's complex in its effects on the body, on biology. It's complex in its effects within um, communities on a, a countrywide level, so social environmental factors, and it's complex in the way that it has um, disparities in how it affects different parts of the world as well. So this is a big problem that doesn't have easy solutions. We know that it's getting worse. We know that between uh, 2000 and 2016, 125 million more people were affected by heat waves. And it's just going to get worse, even if we do manage to hit what we need to hit this decade in terms of carbon emissions, we are still going to be seeing the effects of climate change for decades and decades to come. And we really need to look at what we can do to adapt to that. Next slide, please. So talking a little bit more about urban heat islands, because this is a really critical factor and it really ties back into the equity discussion because we know um, throughout many countries, particularly true here in the United States, but also in other countries as well, that lower socioeconomic um, communities, often communities of colour, have less green space. They have more urban heat islands and they disproportionately therefore suffer from the effects of heat. We know that those urban heat um, island areas can be up to four degrees Fahrenheit hotter. So it's not just a small difference. It really is quite significant. And when you think about the fact that people in these areas are not just staying inside houses, they're getting out, they're moving around, they're working. Those impacts are very real and they're very real impacts on human health. They're very real impacts on the economy as well. Next slide, please. So talking a little more about the intersection um, between individuals and the world that they live in and heat. So there is a lot that goes into predisposing an individual person to heat vulnerability. It's not just their biology. And we're looking on an individual level, it comes down to things like what other medical conditions do they have? What medications are they on? How old are they? What is their personal behaviour and health status like? Do they seek help when they need it? Do they have those social networks that can support them in times of heat waves? So when we, um, in areas where there has been a history of significant heat, so I'm from Adelaide in Australia, where we're used to getting days of 110 degrees in summer. We get more of them now and they last for longer, but that historically has been something that especially the wealthier people in our society are well adapted to deal with. But what we do have is a program where on very hot days, the Red Cross calls people who are elderly, people who are socially isolated and checks in with them um, to ensure that they're staying um, safe in the heat. And that really comes into that contextual environment around people. So do people have a social support system that will look out for them? Can they afford the electricity to run air conditioning? What is their house like? So somewhere like Australia, many houses are built for heat because historically heat has been the challenge that we faced. But in many parts of the world, and, and many of you will have lived experience of this, we saw this in the UK last year as well, when the temperature reaches 110, 113 degrees, the housing isn't built for that. And it's very, very different on a day like that within those houses than it is in, the, in a place that is really built to have that heat resilience. Access to healthcare, how far people have to travel to work. Do they have access to transport that is air conditioned? Do they need to walk for miles and miles every day to get to work in the blazing sun? We've already talked about urban heat islands, but it's all of those things that really come into what makes a person vulnerable to heat. Next slide, please. 
So we just spend just a moment talking about the individual and their biology and how their health is affected by heat. So very obviously, and I think many of us, if we're health professionals, if we're just those in the community, understand a little bit about dehydration and heat stroke and heat exhaustion. What many of us don't understand, and I include health professionals, including emergency physicians, is the very complex effects of heat on most systems of the body. So we do find that on days when it's really hot, we have patients presenting with a whole manner of things that aren't just obvious heat-related illness. So we know that heat has complex interactions on the cardiovascular system, so it can make people more likely to have heart attacks. If people have heart failure, they're more likely to end up in hospital. People who have respiratory illness, such as asthma or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, once again, are more likely to, to suffer from um, the effects of their chronic illnesses, not just presenting in a way that's obviously heat-related. We also see an increase in presentations from kidney disease. Some of that is dehydration. Some is due to interactions with medications that people take and a whole manner of other body systems as well. One thing that we do see also is increased presentations with mental illness, and that is across the spectrum. So it's from increased presentations of people who are suffering from schizophrenia, from depression, um, from even delirium and uh, dementia, so other neurological illnesses. And much of that has to do with their underlying ability for their body to adapt when it's really hot and to mount that response, but also the medications that they take. So many, many, many common medications make people um, have a much harder time to thermoregulate, which is to control their body temperature to um, not be able to sweat as well as they should, which is our body's primary way that we cool down when it's hot and really affects the body's um, ability to just deal with heat generally. So that is a lot of common medications that people take for heart disease, for mental illness, for lung disease. There's a whole litany of, of medications that really predispose people to having worse outcomes when it's hot. We also see an increase in domestic violence and aggression during heat waves, particularly um, gender-based violence against women. So there is really a significant burden of disease beyond what we might think we expect to see during heat waves. Next slide, please. And this is just touching on uh, some more of the indirect impacts. So we have all of the health impacts, but then we also see other things like increased um, rates of drowning and work-related accidents because people are getting out in the water more, they may be feeling a little more off when they're doing their, for example, construction work in the heat, and there is more of a chance that they will have a workplace accident as a result of that. Another very significant thing is the impact that this has on infrastructure. So there are definitely examples of hospitals where heat waves have caused electricity to fail, have caused a failure of IT systems and infrastructure, and then the health system itself can't cope with the impact of the added presentations and added illness that they're seeing. In Australia, outside of the major cities, a lot of our rural populations rely on a service called the Royal Flying Doctor Service to get treatment, which is a fixed wing plane that flies out, picks them up, brings them back to the hospitals in the city. When it's over about 40 degrees Celsius, 45 degrees Celsius, so 115-ish Fahrenheit, the tarmac is often melted and too soft for the plane to fly. So then we see these populations of people that can no longer access the care that they need as well. So there's very real concrete infrastructure challenges as well that affect health systems. Next slide, please. And this is just outlining uh, really the evidence that we see increased hospital presentations, we see increased mortality. And on the right there, it's quite a nice graph that shows um, the emergency hospital admissions during heat waves and really how that tracks. And we definitely see that in practice. I still work clinically and on hot days or the few days afterwards, we definitely see these impacts on the health system. Next slide, please. Can, as as uh, we've discussed and as uh, Natalia outlined really nicely, the social determinants of health and socio-cultural factors are really, really critical in this discussion as well. So we know people that are experiencing poverty, structural racism, that have insecure housing, um, that are socially and economically disadvantaged, are more likely to have higher morbidity and mortality during heat waves and they suffer more. And that extends across um, most impacts of climate change that we see, but is particularly true for heat. Next slide, please. 
I just wanted to spend just a brief moment uh, just discussing migration. So we will see forced migration sort of in the short term where people may get away from areas that are experiencing extreme heat, but also planned migration as well. And this is a really, really tricky thing to discuss. We will see areas within countries that are not inhabitable anymore and that we can't adapt to no matter what we do. And this is felt very acutely by certain populations. So in Australia, our First Nations people, our Aboriginal people, have a particularly strong connection to land, to country, and much of their culture and um, the spiritual aspect of their culture are tied up in the physical land itself. So if we're discussing with many of these communities who live in remote Australia where they are already getting temperatures that are 45 degrees Celsius, to say you can no longer live in this part of country that is part of everything that you hold dear, that's not an easy discussion to have and there's no easy solution to that. So we really need to be thinking outside the box in terms of, of what we need to do now before we get to a point where we're saying to people, you just need to leave. When we're looking at migration as well, there's that really um, circular sort of effect. So when people move, when they have forced displacement, it affects their health. It affects their health long term. We know that when people move away from their primary communities, they're dislocated from their usual healthcare providers. And often they go somewhere where there is not easy access to their previous health records. We see that they lose um, good management of their chronic health and it's very difficult to link them back in again as well. So there is a, a really big separate conversation that we could have around migration and heat and migration and climate change. Um, but that's just a little tiny bit on it. Next slide, please. Okay, and this is my final slide. So this is really a critical thing that I wanted to touch on before we finish. And this is about adaptation. And really just to say that adaptation is incredibly complex. So when we're looking at adaptation, we can't just look at for example, adapting our infrastructure and looking at better air conditioning in communities or more resilient hospitals, although those things are incredibly critical and absolutely need to be part of this discussion. But we also need to be thinking really broadly. We need to be thinking about what makes people vulnerable to heat. So we know that people who live in socially cohesive communities often fare better in the heat. So we need to be kind of looking at the front end of that. What can we do in communities to build that social cohesion, to link people into networks, to look after people like the Red Cross calling elderly or socially isolated people on a hot day. We know that people who have better health fare better in heat waves. What can we do to reinforce our preventative and public health services so that we have people who are healthier, whose chronic disease is managed before they end up in a hospital? And also ensuring that those who are in primary care, who are family physicians or general practitioners, really understand all of the intersections and can have those conversations with their patients to say, you have heart disease, you're more vulnerable, this is your plan. Your diuretic medication will make you more likely to have health effects during the heat. This is your plan. So we need to be thinking about all of those things. And then we need to be thinking about the policy decisions around work, where people work, um, and how we, how we deal with those people who have social disparities as well what we do about ensuring that people have access to air conditioned transport, for example, or air conditioned housing, and all of the things around that. So it's a very complex policy, social governance, cross-sectoral conversation that we need to have to ensure that our communities are adapted to deal with heat and to deal with climate change generally. Next slide, please. I think that's it. Lovely. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kimberly, for your presentation. Um, we will be having uh, a round of questions answered, but uh, let, let us give this opportunity to have all the inputs uh, made. Please feel free to drop in your question in the chat or in the Q&A box uh, at the window, and we will make sure that we come back to those in, in due time. And let me further... Um, uh, present you Gina, Gina Lucarelli. She is the team lead of Accelerator Labs Global Network. And together with Gina, we have embarked the journey of collective intelligence in climate action. Uh, we believe that, that Gina will provide you a good overview about what's going on as, as an Accelerator Lab at UNDP uh, with this regard. Gina, the floor is yours. 
Thank you, Ardita. Um, and thank you so much, Kimberly and Natalia, for this framing. Um, this is a bit of a zoom out here. So, so um, just to look at how we've been using the frame of collective intelligence um, to guide our research and development work on our climate portfolio. Um, basically, what we mean by collective intelligence um, quite simply is, you know, when people work together, that added value that's created often with the help of technology, but not necessarily, um, that mobilizes a wider range of insights, ideas, um, and information. So basically, we think that, um, we think that, sorry, I don't know if you can hear the sirens here in New York, but that's New York par for the course. <laughs> Just a bit of, uh, okay, it's me who can hear it, no worries. So the reason we're taking this collective intelligence approach to climate action is threefold. First, a top-down sort of approach, top-down policy approach, where why, by we would, you know, ban, let's say, fossil fuels is not possible. Um, neither is it possible to dictate top-down adaptation strategies. So what we need here is a distributed, bottom-up way of working. Um, and collective intelligence kind of provides us that uh, opportunity. It helps us diversify how we understand problems and solutions, and yet also we hope gets us to the scale that we need to be acting. The second point here is obviously we need bold action, but there's been a lot of talk in this arena and, and not the action. So we think that, um, we hope actually, that collective intelligence, taking a collective intelligence approach can create a constituency of people who understand the complexity of the issue and can hold uh, governments to account over time. Um, so really building that constituency for climate action is key, and we think a collective intelligence approach will help us with that. With that. And the third point is really just to say everything that we're going to do from now on in is going to be difficult decisions. There are obviously trade-offs. And just listening to you, Kimberly and Natalia, speak, it's it's very clear um, that that each of these decisions on, you know, how, how where we invest in adaptation, obviously there none of these decisions are going to be easy. Where people live, what kinds of jobs they're able to do, how they heat and cool their homes. Um, these are personal issues. These are policy issues. These are not easy ones. There's going to be winners and losers in the story. And so we hope that a collective intelligence frame also helps us take deliberative action. So to make these tough decisions by consulting a wider range of people. So basically what we're doing is running a series of prototypes um, and research on how collective intelligence can help with climate action. Um, this is advancing some of the work that we did in 2020 one on how collective intelligence can help sustainable development at large. So they're looking at a broader view of um, all of the sustainable development goals. Now we're zeroing in on collective intelligence and climate action. Um, to see the work we've done before, we can pop it in the chat. Um, you can go to smartertogether.earth. Um, this is sort of the predecessor of the work that we're doing now with the team in UNDP North Macedonia alongside uh, several other countries. Essentially, the basic sort of breakthrough uh, from a research perspective is developing use cases for how collective intelligence adds value to sustainable development work. So we're looking at things like, you know, anticipating and monitoring systemic risks. So here there's a lot of work, as you well know, in, in public health fields um, with citizen science, um, et cetera. Um, looking at real-time monitoring of the environment, you know, applying sensors for air pollution, using, again, citizen science, which kind of uh, brings together uh, policymakers, uh, scientists, and citizens who can gather data on marine debris, um, biodiversity loss, et cetera. So we start to un understand how a collective intelligence approach actually, which part of the climate problem does it solve? Um, now we're working with the team in North Macedonia, which is focusing on, on the tough decisions that have to be made on a citywide basis um, to prevent heat re related deaths and, and illness um, in, in Skopje and beyond. Um, we're also working with um, 15 other countries. Uh, South Africa, for example, is using a collective intelligence approach to develop scenarios for um, the just energy transition that needs to happen in South Africa. Um, we'll ha they'll have about 50,000 coal workers um, who will be out of work as they transition towards other energy sources. 
Um, and then we're working with the team in Fiji who are um, really trying to tap into uh, solar power as, as a source of renewable energy, but trying to use deliberative methods to understand how best to use excess solar power for community benefit, for productive benefit. So, so this is the kind of work that's that's happening there. So all of this is aimed towards, um, you know, we will be producing a report together with uh, Nesta's Center for Collective Intelligence Design. They're looking at over 100 cases of how organizations are using collective intelligence for climate action. Um, and the work we're doing prototyping in North Macedonia and other countries, we're hoping will provide us an evidence base um, to feed into the community of parties discussion, um, the 28th one um, in November of this year, um, which will happen in the United Arab Emirates. There's a specific focus there on creating an adaptation framework, and we would hope that some of this kind of bottom-up distributed um, experiential knowledge, we can feed into that adaptation framework that will be developed at COP28. So thank you so much for the opportunity to join you, and uh, back to you, Ardita. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot, Gina. So uh, just following on the points that Gina made, Accelerate Lab team, uh, head of exploration, Igor Izotov, head of experimentation, Lazar Popiranov, and the head of our environment portfolio, Anita Kojoman, and myself, we joined forces together also with other colleagues and other interested partners from the ecosystem. We tried to actually uh, explore the ways that we can uh, learn from the communities, but also tap into the greater knowledge that comes from these communities into, into uh, actionable knowledge that we can use and, and hopefully amplify. On behalf of the team, I will just share a few slides on the idea of what are we doing and how we are really looking into this, but it will be very brief so that would allow enough time for, for Q&As and, and possibly discussion. Um, I think right now you're able to see my screen. Uh -huh. Okay, great. So uh, what we are doing here in North Macedonia, we actually looked at extreme weather events that impact they have on urban com communities. And with, we have looked at this with an increased focus on heat and heat waves. Why urban communities? Because there is a trend of internal migration happening, and that's going to be also a global trend. Basically, it is expected that uh, people will live in urban communities. Uh, more than 63% of people will live in urban communities by 2050. So it's not isolated case only for, for North Macedonia, but it's rather a general trend how people move. Why this is important? Because we have an increased average temperatures in a in couple of cities, but also locations in, in North Macedonia. And this can be backed up with the data that we received from the Hydrometeorologic Institute. In 2018, UNDP had already an intervention on urban heat islands with really mapping the heat in the city with the thermal maps and how uh, action points and prescribed solution to, to the existing challenge could be implemented. And there is also a very vibrant media and civil society organizations that have been very vocal, in particularly about the design aspects, like how we design the cities, are we designing the cities to be inclusive and cool for everyone involved and everyone really sharing the space, urban space. Uh, the data here is within the last 10 years, what we have had. However, you would be able to see that the peak is in a pre-pandemic period. It's almost two degrees hotter. So only within the Skopje, which uh, with the pandemics, the certain amount of mobility was reduced. So we believe that this data really reflects a bit on that. And currently with 2023, we anticipate that the, that the mid-year temperatures would be around 14.6, again, coming back, bouncing back actually to the high peak that we had a few years ago. Uh, how communities are affected so why we do this with the community so we have really been looking at citizens but we also have been looking at local governments because we have an intertwined relations who citizens look at okay 
uh, do I have an access to the cooling system? Is this really showing off on my energy bill? But the institutions do all have the same. I'm employing X, Y number of people in the administration. Will I be able to really pay off the cooling bills in the summer as well as that in the larger discussion, for example, with the with the with the uh, energy crisis, it's it's more and more important and really targeting this. But nevertheless, there are also other aspects that we see. For example, water scarcity. How do we manage the water? Water being among one and primarily uh, address to cool off, whether that we are cooling off through fountains and through really having this urban infrastructure in place, or is are we talking about water scarcity in the context of agriculture or in the context of business processes or in context of health? And that would, would, would come back into the discussions coming very strongly from citizens, but also from local communities. So uh, what we are doing as an initiative within country office, we are looking at couple of things as as previously highlighted by by all of the speakers we can't really look at irreversible change with only one entry point we are looking at this as a larger uh, avenue where a couple of things can be explored in terms of looking at how we can get citizens knowledge involvement but also participation and that would be one of the major components that we are looking for citizens engagement on the other side we are also looking at how we can really save water by creative challenges and really providing drinking water to the communities throughout the city, but also deliberation and data drills that are uh, as a method to really sensitize the urban planners uh, to take into account climate change when they are designing the expansion, designing the interventions in the city. Nevertheless, uh, we have initiated uh, cooling solutions um, safari where we are mapped global solutions that have been used by local governments, by communities, by private sector throughout the world, what we can learn from those and how we can use this knowledge into, into localized context and how we can actually uh, advocate for more of these solutions within our communities. Currently, we are having a database of 100, no, 250 solutions that are mapped that we really need to analyze and get their insights and, and, and try to translate this into local context. Last but not least, we have been looking at what are the data sources do we have? Can we generate new data streams and how we can use this data to tell the story of what has happened, what is happening and what is going to happen more likely and with with really based on on the on the evidence that is coming from data this ranges from satellite images to really generating data by by citizens and really putting all of this into decision making process with processes but also future planning of cities and and communities and that would be on our behalf so uh, uh, colleagues uh, and and guests, uh, I'm just checking right now if I'm missing anything uh, in particular with with the questions. So we might open up the the floor to questions. Uh, I asked my colleagues uh, Lazar and Igor to monitor the the chat part. If you have spotted any of the questions that we would like to to raise. We can do it now, or if you have posted a chat on the on the on the section, you can please unmute yourself and then ask the question. Okay. I'm just looking at this. Uh, we have uh, Tyler Robinson. Would you want to unmute yourself? I see Armin has his hand up. Armin, perhaps you can jump in until 
we yeah. have the question. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Ardita, and thank you, colleagues, uh, co-presenters. Uh, I think a lot of food for thought, and I actually have a question to probably all presenters uh, regarding uh, something that we have discussed uh, recently with the Ministry of Finance here and Ministry of Environment. Uh, we wanted to understand, is there a methodology and if there are uh, studies that are conducted uh, somewhere uh, on quantification of the heat impact on health in terms of reduced productivity and increased financial burden for the state. It, because Ministries of Finance somehow operate on numbers only. And uh, this is an argument that they can read and clearly understand and translate it into actions. And uh, I should also say that the uh, Minister of Finance of North Macedonia was in New York last week and he met with our regional director and with Deputy Secretary General. And uh, at least with the regional director, as I was preparing some talking points, this is part of this was part of the discussion. So I think it is also prioritized at the government, and I think it is very likely that at some point the NDP here will be asked whether we can support government in uh, actually monetization of the heat impact on the uh, humans on the workforce in one side, but on the other side on youth and elderly because. While they are not economically productive, they are uh, subsidized or supported financially by the government, and they would like to understand what is the difference between uh, between the subsidies that they would do without action and with action to reduce uh, the negative impact on heat uh, of heat on uh, health and consecutively on economic productivity. Thank you. I'm happy to jump in, uh, although yes, Kimber please. thanks, Ardita. So I don't have the numbers, um, Armin, and I'm sure Kimberly might know some studies, but I think the quantification of the cost is quite complicated because if you're talking about the quantification of the impact versus the adaptation cost. So the things that Kimberly talked about, for example, making public transportation, whether you have buses, air conditioned, or thinking about infrastructure costs, those are going to be huge costs. You can also think about the labor productivity decrease if, if for example, and I'm, I'm looking to Taylor's question, if for you know, six hours of the day, you can't do outdoor construction and you can only do it, you know, 6 a.m. to 8 a.m. and 9, you know, that limits the number of hours. So there's so many different models that you could um, look at. And I think it's really important to think about um, long term, the the impacts on children and education, you know, there, there are going to be long term impacts to um, Kimberly, if you want to jump in and, and I'll speak a little bit to Taylor's question, too. Yeah, absolutely. And um... Thanks, Natalia. I think that's absolutely spot on. So there have been a handful of studies around, and I'm aware of a couple that are around um, cost of reduced labour, and I'm aware of a couple that are around healthcare cost of increased presentations and hospitalizations. One of the significant issues that we've had is that we haven't been accurately, and this, this is still holds true, capturing all of the heat-related presentations to hospital because so many are indirect. And we know that clinicians aren't good. No clinician is good at saying when somebody walks in, unless they're saying, I have heat stroke, I have heat exhaustion. Is their asthma worse because it's heat? And a lot of our clinicians don't even think about it. So then how do you attribute that to heat if you're not even thinking about it? And then how do you look at the costs associated with that? So I'm aware of some work that's going on um, around syndromic surveillance for heat as well and trying to better capture the indirect effects. And then from there, we can look more at the actual costs of the healthcare system, because I think we're dramatically underestimating exactly what these impacts are economically as well. But this is certainly an area that we need to do more work in. And I completely agree. I also work for the government of South Australia in, in climate and health. And I know that when we try to argue something, it's the money that talks and it's not us talking about people as people. So um, it's definitely an area for more research. And maybe I can jump um, to Taylor's yes. question because there are financial implications there. So Taylor asked, you know, are there policies that can be put in place 
to mitigate versus exacerbate the impacts. And for example, um, she asked US federal funding that could help mitigate. So if we know poor people live in cities and are more exposed to heat, um, you know, like a, a heat island, so you're already exposed to higher heat, so your cost of electricity will be higher, it, even if you have air conditioning. Like, could the government offset sort of that? Could they pay for electricity? Or could they set up cooling stations in all the libraries um, and all, all the public buildings and run them, you know, 24-7 as cooling stations? Those will have costs. I mean, I think for a country like the U.S., the answer is yes, the U.S. could be doing a lot. Now, for a country that is much poorer and doesn't have that sort of flexibility, we go back to Gina's point about trade-offs. You know, how will governments make the trade-offs and when to and where to invest their limited resources? And that's where uh, UNDP is, is really important. But this is where the equity piece has to be central. You know, equity can't be an afterthought. It has to be part of the decision making around the trade-offs. And unfortunately, and, and this is where, I don't know, Gina, if you can speak a little bit to this, um, too often, you know, the people who are most impacted are not at the table, are not part of the decision making. So whether collective intelligence and this collective science and citizen science can break down some of that so that there can be more uh, bottom up um, and in terms of which policies work or don't work. Obviously, some have big price tags, but some might not have a price tag at all. For example, changing the times when kids go to school, you know, moving the schedule up. It's not ideal. You know, we we have the 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 data, you know, the teenagers should not be starting school before nine. But if the classroom gets really hot from 11 to two, you may have to start the day at 6 a.m. Or, you know, it won't be ideal. So there will be trade offs even that in terms of education. But heat may be the priority there. Um, so, Gina, I don't know if you want to speak a little bit to some of the, you know, how do you how do you incorporate voices of those who are most excluded in political processes? And and how do we make the the financial ask? Well, I don't think I have a you know magic wand on this one, and probably it'd be better to hear from from Ardita, Lazar, and Igor who are who are doing the work on the ground. I mean, from a kind of theoretical perspective, we like the collective intelligence approach because it um, it it can help you level the playing field and kind of diversify who you listen to, right? So if the sort of founding premise is that to understand systemic effects, you have to talk to, you know, everyone, not just those who traditionally have power, right? Um, we've done work on this with deforestation in Uganda, where um, the team, you know, not only brought in, of course, the Ministry of Environment, um, and of course, you know, sort of some of the big energy uh, consumers um, in the public sector, but also those who are making a living off of logging um, and illegal charcoal production in in the forest. Um, it, this it, It's tricky how you do this, and I do think the team in North Macedonia knows better, particularly in this context, um, what kind of voices they are bringing in and how they're balancing um, that out. But this is really core to it is kind of, you know, diversity is our only hedge against uncertainty. And if there's one thing we know, it's going to be pretty uncertain from, from here on in. Um, so we like the collective intelligence approach because it helps us diversify how we understand problems. Thanks, Gina. Colleagues, anyone wants to pick up on that? Lazar? Yeah, thank you, Ardita. I think a part of the answer, and I'll just try to link it with a part of my role within the Accelerator Lab team, I think that the promise and the power of experimentation is that we can deploy different tools and processes and test what works and what doesn't work. And also as an Accelerator Lab, we're trying to see whether different interventions would make sense in our context and would they bring the voices needed uh, into the conversation. So, for instance, one of the things that we did in the first phase of the collective intelligence studio that we're a part of was we tried to pilot um, uh, an engagement mechanism, an engagement tool to see whether citizens would be interested in having a conversation about their local urban plans and would they be willing to advocate for better local urban plans, greener municipalities, etc. So we deployed that tool as a small experiment and the amount of feedback that we've received from citizens is that not only are they willing to go the extra step and, for instance, investigate their neighborhood, see the green oasis within their neighborhoods, but also advocate for better urban plans and go to their municipalities and advocate on uh, behalf of other people. So those are the small interventions that we're now trying throughout our society to see what type of interventions would actually work on the long run. Another one, for instance, uh, with Ardita and Igor, we worked with 
Um, trying, we used an, an already existing network of high school students, and we tried to duplicate that pilot, but focused on high school students in different municipalities in Skopje. And what we quickly learned is when peers to peers talk about heat waves in some schools, usually in the urban settings in Skopje, it's not that much of a problem because they just turn the AC on and they have very nice yards where they can play, etc. But in some municipalities and in, in, in some parts of our cities and communities, it is increasingly becoming a problem because they can't afford, for instance, the AC or there are too many kids in the classroom, etc. So for us, it's very important that we continuously have the small pilots and small experiments to test whether we can bring voices into the conversation about heat waves and whether we can actually include them into the decision making process uh, as a UNDP. Hope that made sense. Thanks. Thanks, Adwita. Thanks, colleagues. Any other thoughts that are coming? I see that there are a lot of exchanges going on in the chat, sharing resources, sharing data. Uh, we will make sure that we keep track on those and then can further uh, share with interested colleagues. However, feel free to raise hand or unmute yourself if you have any additional um, comment, any additional um, uh, from my side, I think that what we really looked into when we were working with communities is that in order to engage with different communities, we have to have different mechanisms. We have to use different tools. And that was something that we we tried to do as a team, really diversify the tools that we are using in order to be able to have this really conversation also meaningful in terms of what is the impact. For example, if we are talking about the aspects of mobility, how do you commute? That also has to do a lot with the heat. So nobody would really be choosing to commute on foot or with a public transportation in an extreme heat weather. Whereas this can be this can be redesigned in terms of really green corridors with shades where people can cycle and then they can bike. This sort of feedback we really got interesting insights from communities where where we were able to talk and we are very aware that people living in informal settlements would have a totally different experience from how climate change and how heat waves really affect the way that they perceive the summer, the summer heat and, and the weather in, in their neighborhoods. And uh, we have a very good, uh, good example of, of a neighborhood being extremely exposed to, to vulnerabilities that is coming from the weather. Any additional comments, colleagues? We are quite on time, so before we uh, set the day, two minutes more left. Let me just briefly uh, do point few few important notes that we took. We I took during the presentation. We are looking at extreme weather, heat in particular, having multiple entry points and making an interesting conversation, but also a conversation important to engage different communities within uh, the processes. There is no such a thing that is a local or national problem. I think that one of the most important aspects is this integral approach in understanding and really adapting to climate change that would require close collaboration, not only from policymakers, also from city managers, but also from communities who are living within the vicinities. I think uh, one important aspect that came with quantification is extremely difficult. We cannot quantify uh, when we do not have a clear definition of what is the aftermath of a heat wave or a heat stroke, because some of the some of the uh, immediate effects are seen in the short run, but we also can observe immediate effects. Uh, effects in the long run. So that is one of the aspects that we we can really think into, into heat in a long-term perspective because changes do happen and we need to notice. I think that we need to also be able to look into partnerships, what more we can do in terms of really cooling down the cities and designing the cities to cool off themselves passively 
while while we have heat and heat waves. And last but not least, I think that the uh, voice of everyone should be in the table. And we are the ones who have perhaps the privilege to, to support. And we are the ones who can actually design tools and methods where we can uh, engage more and more uh, conversations in this area. And uh, last but not least, advocacy is never enough. So we can be even more in our in our attempts can be even louder in our attempts on talking about the ne negative impacts of climate change and human health. Thank you all on my behalf. Uh, any other closing remarks from from your side? I just want to thank you, Ardita, for inviting us and also for the colleagues from India, Barbados. I saw that it was quite a, a diverse audience. So mm -hmm. thank you so much for the opportunity. And the FXB Center would love to continue working with UNDP on this. Great, thank you. So I will uh, just uh, share the resources after this call and perhaps we can discuss next uh, joint action and action points uh, and uh, see where we can take this conversation from. Thank you, colleagues. Thanks, everyone, for joining Thanks us so today. It was lovely having you all. Thanks so much, Ardita and team. Bye-bye. Have a good day. Bye-bye.